Today, we discuss Miro. Today, I want to talk about the hellscape that is technical diagramming, right? Everybody's nodding their heads right now. Uh Uh-huh. And there is a potential solution that I want to share. There was one name that several people brought up. I did some digging, and it's kind of nuts how much this program Miro has for developers. I have to share this. It could potentially be a game changer for you. So my favorite part about Miro is that half the work is already done. Like right now, typically we spend hours starting diagrams from scratch, gathering information. You get buy-in from every team. Uh, You know, that's a lot of work to do. But Miro has a full set of integrations with the tools you're probably already using. And they also offer open APIs and SDKs for custom solutions for all those niche diagramming use cases we have to do, right? So the end result is the same, but it doesn't take forever. It's a massive, massive time saver. I'm transforming basic flowcharts and network architectures, and it all lives in one place. So are you using Miro? Have you used it? I want to hear. That's M-I-R-O dot com. Edit audio. I had been working at VH1 for years when the guy who was my boss, my friend, my mentor left. And a new boss came in. Now, the new guy did me a solid. He kept me around, which, you know, I'm thankful for. But then after like a little bit, he discovered I was actually a pretty darn good worker. And that's when he started with all the promotion talk. He could not understand why I didn't want to advance and have the office and the SVP title. And no matter how many times I explained to him that I was an actor and a writer and that this was just my day job, it never seemed to land. I mean, he would walk away saying he got it, but I could see the slight tilt of his head, the squinting of the eyes, and looking back at me as if to say, what is she thinking? And before you know it, he'd be standing back at my desk again talking about, ooh, you know what you should do? Start a concierge business with membership fees to high-level execs. You could get the fees, take a cut of the profits. I would be your first client. (sighs) He lost me at concierge business. All I could think was, am I not being clear about wanting to just stay an assistant? Why is it so hard for people to understand that I don't want a traditional path? Hello, folks. I'm Robin Hopkins, and this is Well Adjusting, where I talk to people about life stuff, but, you know, not in an NPR way, more like a we're at the bar, we're having cocktails, and I am getting into your business sort of way. Oh, we love a cocktail. Oh, and producer Steph is here too. Oh yeah, hi, that's me. Today we chat, well, what if I don't want to be promoted? Oh, okay, folks, it is time to welcome today's guest, Sam. Now, we knew we wanted to talk about swimming upstream against societal pressures, especially in the workplace, and Sam answered our call out on the socials. And I will tell you, we had quite the convo about the concept of you do you, boo. So let's get right to it. I think like the one, the big question would be, is this drive we all experience to have the white picket fence, get married, find the like massive career goals? Is it internal or externally driven? And is our reaction to it? driven more from who we are or from who we want to impress. Interesting. And, you know, like that leads me to a question right away, because when a person asks that question, it makes me think you're going against the grain. So I want you to tell me a little bit about how you feel about drive and people's perceptions and just a little bit about you in there. Yeah. So I remember being 18, 19 and thinking that what I wanted was I wanted to have, you know, the 401k, not that I knew what that was, and like the (laughs) high paying job. And I wanted like people to hear what my job was and think, oh, wow, she's got her life together and get married and have kids and buy a house in the city I grew up in. And then, you know, stuff happens. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, let me reevaluate some stuff here. So I wanted to be an actor. I was going to go into acting or script coordination or costuming or something like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I got all of the standard things of, okay, but how are you going to make a living with that? Mm -hmm. But I had this thing. I was not going to spend crazy amounts of money on tuition unless I was able to get into like the school I wanted. Okay. Because that's a lot of money. 
And yeah. I didn't grow up rich, so I was more aware of that than most of my peers were. Yep. And so I didn't get into the school I wanted. So so what did you do? Were you like, I'm not going? Yeah, I was like, I'm not going to go this year. I'm going to work really? this year and audition again next year. And I didn't get in the next year. At what point is society and like the people around you starting to go, what are you doing? Well, so I was a little bit lucky in that maybe six months out of high school, I got a, like a really good job um, working with the government. So people did not question so much for like two years because they're like, oh, OK, Sam's actually working like a good job. And then uh, I quit that job because as an 18 year old, I didn't know how to deal with a bad supervisor. And instead, mm-hmm. of, instead of like going to HR about it, I was just like, well, fine, I quit. Which That's you know, a path. That is a path. That is, that is a path. It is, it is definitely a choice I made. But around that time, I had people pointing out to me, you know, you really like clothes and you really like helping people figure out what to wear. Maybe you should go into fashion. Fairly close to where I lived, um, there was a certificate you could do in fashion design. It was like a two year. I just did the first year. I didn't go back. And there was definitely starting to be more echoes of, okay, acting fell through. Fashion has fallen through. You need to start. You need to get on a path. Yeah. And like all of my my friends are finishing their, their degrees. Some of them are starting to look into grad programs. And I'm like, yeah. So I'm, I'm curious where you are now in terms of like your job. And I want to know um, how that presents to you today, like what you're feeling and, and how that pressure is showing up in your life to be like everybody else. I just happened to get a, a decent job working for an arts org, just doing administrative work. And it turns out I'm really good at it. It's not something that you ever really encounter. And no one's ever like, you should strive to be an administrative assistant. <laughs> that should be your goal. The fallacy is that you need to come in as an assistant or a coordinator, and then you need to work your way up and that every single person strives to be the SVP in the corner office. And some make it and then most don't. You know, but everybody's got their own ceiling. That's the perception that you should want that. Exactly. I want the corner office, but I want the corner office because of all the windows that I can look out of and see trees and birds and squirrels running around. I don't want the corner office if it means I have to be the boss. I will and sit you do. in my little like closet. <laughs> you do. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So maybe you gotta maybe you gotta assist the corner office so you can go in and see the windows on your lunch break. That's exactly the goal. So I'm in arts administration. I've discovered I'm really good at it. I really like helping people achieve their artistic goals and then going to be in bed by 9 p.m. <laughs> so uh, when I was working at the, the previous arts org I was with, I got a lateral promotion. And my supervisor has a conversation with me about how there's not going to be a lot of space for upward movement in this organization. And I'm like, can I still get like raises? Yeah. Okay. I'm okay with that. This is the moment where I'm going, oh crap. Maybe I don't have goals. Right. This is the moment where I'm like, I don't know the answer to the where do you want to be in five years? Because before this, I've, I've always known what I want my five-year plan to be. And this is the moment where I'm going, okay, everything I thought I wanted to achieve, I'm realizing I didn't. Now, is that a scary place or is that an exciting place? Terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. I'm wondering if your terror is more about societal pressure or if it's about not knowing, because it sounds like it might be more the first thing. At the time, it's the not knowing. At least I think it is. And then in hindsight, it's the societal pressure. It's, it was like coming out as bisexual all over again, mm-hmm. where all of a sudden I was going to be telling people that I was not going to do what I was supposed to do according to, you know, this imaginary script we're all working off of. Yeah. I'm not like the script has never seen an editor. No, no one's ever edited this script we're all following. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and the question that I want to ask you is like, but are you happy in this moment? Like, are you happy with your job? Are you fulfilled in other ways that are outside of your career? I am. And this is where this like little epiphany is where this terror turns to excitement is I realize I can just go move to Europe. Anytime. So that's what I did. I picked up and I moved to Ireland for two years. 
Nice. Yeah. I've never been able to do that. I, I would have to plan that. <laughs> and because I was taking admin jobs there that weren't, you know, huge managerial ones, I was able to keep going like, hey, you know what? I'm going to go pop over to Edinburgh for the weekend for Fringe. Yeah. Being a bar manager is a super respected career path there. There is still societal pressure in Ireland that you should have a path, but I knew plenty of people who were, you know, ranging anywhere from their 20s to their 70s whose whole careers had been working in a bar. And it was totally accepted. So all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I'm not the only person. I fit in here. I fit in here. And at the same time, I am still getting that like external gratification of everyone's like, oh my gosh, Sam picked up and moved to Ireland. That is so right. cool of her. Yeah. So it's, I'm For the I'm first time to... your plan of doing it was like cool versus exactly. like, what is she doing? It is. But it's also very interestingly like, juxtaposed with, I also love research and I love Excel spreadsheets and I wow. have Who a doesn't? three tab Excel spreadsheet about where I'm going to move when this visa is up. Uh, I've narrowed it down to three places and then my cousin has a kid and I'm like, I'm going back to Canada. I'm, right. I'm going to go meet this kid. And then this is where the terror strikes in again. I'm there and my, my skin is crawling. My skin is tight because all of a sudden all of these questions are coming up again about what am I going to do? So what's my plan now? I've had my fun. Mm. Time to get back on the path. All right, people, raise your hand if you have ever been personally exhausted by email, right? Same, friend, same. We're all so constantly inundated with email. And if you're like me, going through your inbox becomes less about responding to everything and more about just finding a way to keep tabs on the messages that really matter, you know, like the ones from the school telling me my kids are in trouble that I get all the time. Anyway, that's where SaneBox comes in. Think of it as an EMT for your email. As messages flow in, SaneBox does the triage for you, sifting only the important emails in your inbox and directing all the other distracting stuff, you know what I'm talking about, into your Sane Later folder. So you know what messages you need to pay attention to now and what stuff you can get to like, you know, like eventually after maybe a nap or I don't know, a cocktail. It also, and I I know I'm waxing poetically, but it has some very handy features like the same black hole where you can drag messages from annoying senders that you never want to hear from again. Bye, friend. Oh, and it also has sane reminders to ping you if someone hasn't replied to your email by a certain date. I mean, nothing like having to follow up on your follow-up, am I right? All right, best of all, you can use SaneBox with any email client or phone anywhere you check your email. I mean, come on. See how SaneBox can magically remove distractions from your inbox with a free two-week trial. That's a deal. Visit SaneBox.com slash well today to start your trial, and you're going to get a $25 credit. That's S-A-N-E-B-O-X dot com slash W-E-L-L. Go ahead, folks. Get it. I suddenly realized I don't want to be in charge, but I did realize I wanted my voice to be heard more. Interesting. So I started looking for managerial positions. Why? Why did you do that? Why did you go against what you say? Because I'd gone from I need to want to be the corner office person to I'm going to just be a total, you know, hippie who just goes with the flow and has no goals and realized that like I had kind of over course corrected. Mm hmm. But the reason I like arts administration is because you're helping people achieve their goals. And in this position, I'm able to like kind of help the people who are just entering the career path without being the person that like, you know, the big boss is yelling at or even the buck doesn't stop with me. I never want to be the person the buck stops with. I want to turn my phone off at five o'clock. I think it's good that you acknowledge that and you know that about yourself. And you know what you need to make yourself feel whole and and like a voice and that you're not kowtowing to the pressure. How would you feel? I mean, I'm just 
curious, like, how would you feel if someone that you're managing went and then became your manager? I've never been competitive. I've never been jealous. So if either of the two people that I'm managing right now ended up, if we all stayed in the same organization and they moved up the ranks and I stayed here, kudos. If that's what they want, go for it. Do you think you would feel judgment, though? Like more judgment from other people? So much judgment. Um, I was talking to someone recently and they were doing their five-year plan. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to achieve this. And then after that, I'm going to achieve this. And then the third step is going to be this. I was like, cool. My five-year goal is I'm going to figure out how to make ravioli. And the, like, that's not even a joke. That is literally like the first no, thing that came it. to I'm mind. I'm not laughing at you. I'm like, laughing because I love it. The look on her face was just, you're a manager and your big goal in life is to make ravioli. Well, and, and you're, you're skirting around the thing that I really wanted to ask you is, how do you feel about this, about these people with that judgment? Like you had to, a friend asked you this question, you said what you said, and then they looked at you with judgment. Like, how do you feel about having to walk through all that? So that's something I'm still kind of learning how to deal with. Cause there's, for the most part, I'm like, yeah, it's fine. I'm used to it. I've been getting these looks for a while now, but there is still like, it is, it's 30 years of, of unlearning that I have to do. So I still sometimes have that like knee jerk reaction where I, I need to defend myself. I don't drive. And anytime someone's like, sorry, wait, what do you mean? You don't drive. And my instant knee jerk reaction is to defend my choice to do that. To explain it, to go through it. So I, I still have that because it, it comes from all of these different corners. You get it from your friends, you get it from your coworkers. And the, the one that surprises me the most is how frequently it comes from people who, my life has no effect on you. You are. Yeah, what do you care if who, I don't drive? I didn't ask you for a ride. What's the problem? Exactly. And it's, it's the same with the career path. It was the same thing when I came out of it's just learning not to care when people make that face, mm. which is hard and it's it's so so stupid that the onus is on me it is unfair to to, i do sometimes have to seek outside validation of the fact that i don't want to seek outside validation which is a little bit trippy but happens um some of it should i'm hoping get easier as time goes on because I am kind of at a point now where I'm like I would love to do lots of like lateral moves because I love trying new things um which is also I think something that confuses people so they're like but you you love constantly changing what you're doing when I'm in the ladder be that I'm like yeah but I can also just do it laterally I don't I don't have to go up the world is so wide it's huge yeah. why am I supposed to exist in one direction why can't I exist in all of the directions Oh my God, that's the best. Why can't I exist in all the directions? I mean, I have like really poofy hair, so my hair is already trying to exist in all the directions. <laughs> <laughs> but that is it. So I hate the word drive desperately, but I do think drive is what people think it is. Drive is passion. It is wanting something enough to go for it. I just think Do you that, hate the word passion. No, I love the word passion. I wish we replaced the word drive with passion because there is this societal connotation that drive is career. Um, and people say it all the time. They're like, I'm looking for a partner with big drive. And I'm like, mm-hmm. you're mm-hmm. always but you're always saying that in relation to you want them to have a passion to go further in their career. You're never saying I want them to have a big drive to raise honeybees. Yeah. Well, it's a hop, skip, and a jump from drive to lazy. Those two things exist like the opposite side of the coin. If you don't have drive, then you're lazy, you know? And I wonder if you hear in people's judgment, are they are they coming at you with that lazy filter because you don't want to move up, you know? Yeah, some of them do, definitely. Some of them definitely perceive it to be lazy. Um, I, I think part of my... Which stinks. I mean, it's oh, like it you're does. doing all these really interesting and different things. It doesn't make you lazy. It just means you just don't want to follow the path that has been, everyone said you were supposed to. And yeah, like you said, like, that's an unedited script. Yeah. And people are like, um, you're really lazy because you don't want to go to XYZ event. You just want to sit at home in your pajamas. It's like, no, this, the, the big thing is, 
I'm going to get as much joy from sitting still in my yard reading a book as you're going to get from that event. And there's an argument to be made, by the way, that I'm missing a lot of joy because I'm already planning my next thing. Like I on the, on the last podcast I did, we got some funding. I got the news, an email, walked back to the bathroom. By the time I came back to the kitchen, I was already like, okay, so we got this funding. So then that means I could do this. And then I could, maybe I could leave my day job. Maybe that means I could do this. But then I'm going to think about this, 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 this. And it was like, I did not even allow myself more joy than from my computer in my bedroom to the bathroom. That was the moment. That's how much joy I was allowed before I started planning. So there's really an argument to be made that I am doing it all wrong. But I mean, does the planning bring you joy? It calms me. It's like that soothes me because the unknown and the chaos makes me feel um, like I don't know what's coming. I don't know what it is. But there is also a vibration that happens that is exciting for me of like, ooh, ooh, and that means I could do this and ooh, that means that. Like, But I just wish I could just maybe sit in a chair and look at birds more or just have my goal be to make raviolis. I'd, I think I mean, some are... You know, more toward you would be good for me. I don't know. But the the thing is, did this just turn into you fixing me? Because I think it did. Yeah, I'm gonna fix you, Robin. I'm gonna fix you. Uh, I think I've come across as being like this person who's totally chill, goes with the flow, whatever. No, I am deeply, desperately anxious person. Yeah. And so I was stressed the other day and went and bought myself like a really fancy weekly planner. And this is why I'm good at administration is I like to see like the next four months ahead of me so that I can be, yeah. I, I don't like it when people impromptu are like, Hey, we're going to a party right now. I'm like, uh, ooh, okay. <laughs> see, I love that. I'm like, woo. I'm down for it. I will absolutely say, yes, let's go to the party, but I still need like a minute for my brain to like, to catch up. Yeah. Like my brain does do this like one minute planning. Yeah. The so it's is, not the planning. It's just that you don't feel like you need to be the president. I don't need to be the president. And and if planning brings me joy and then, you know, throwing that plan away also brings me joy. Why can't I do both? I love setting things in motion and then handing them off. I want to know what what you're passionate or driven about in your life. Um, so that depends on the month. I'm a bit of a fickle person. I jump from hobby to hobby. I'm one of those those people who picks up knitting for six months and then drops it and picks it up three years later. Mm. Right now, and this is why my example is beekeeping, I'm really into the concept of beekeeping. I'm super into it. I really want to go get to know some beekeepers. I love this. It's something super exciting. And I'm also really into fungi right now. So I'm reading like every book I can find about mushrooms and mycelial networks and how they help trees talk. And that is something that like is kind of a standing interest of mine. But, you know, in two months, I'm probably going to get really into like acrylic painting again. And then I'll move on. You know, I feel like remember when Shonda Rhimes came out with that The Year of Yes book? Mm -hmm. I feel like your version of this book and what you should focus on is the year of yes and no. And you should say yes to everything that strikes your fancy. You have a job that keeps the lights on. You, it makes you happy. I wouldn't even worry or think about that. I would say yes to everything. And then the second you no longer want to do it, say no. And I say continue to fight off the negative people and continue to, uh, you know, be passionate about the things that bring you joy outside of your job. I, I just think, to me, I just see, keep doing it more. And that is what I try to do. I run into issues sometimes where, because what brings me joy is arts administration, and a vast majority of those people are huge extroverts, and I'm, like, definition introvert. Mm. Uh, a lot of the time I'll be like, no, that's not going to bring me joy today. And it helps that a good number of my friends are some kind of neurodivergent. So we all kind of work together to be like, hey, it is okay that you're going to do this thing weird. It's so funny because I was just going to say, I was just going to say, I feel like another goal for you for this year should be to just look for more people like you. Because I feel like the more support you can have around yourself to say that you are doing just a okay the less judgment comes at you. So I lied to you guys. I do have, I think, one overarching goal. Oh, that will I want to hear it. I want to hear it. My one goal would be, I want to make it okay for people to go, I want to put my art out on social media, but I do not want to go viral or become an influencer. <laughs> uh, I, there's this whole thing right now where, where 
and in some places you need to for money, but anything you're passionate about, you're supposed to turn into a side hustle right now. Yes. Yes, you are. Everything's a side hustle. Everything's a side hustle right now. And I want us to get away from it. Unless you genuinely like turning it into a side hustle, you can do something that you like doing just for fun. I, and I, I, I want this. to make people feel like it's okay to be like, actually, I don't want to monetize yeah. these super amazing paintings I do. I just want to keep making them and giving them to friends. I think you should take on being a voice. Like your slogan should be like, don't monetize this and, and make t-shirts. But then you see, I just turned it into a business. <laughs> You're making me try to monetize it. I tried to make you monetize, don't monetize it. And I'm trying to make you into a don't monetize it influencer. I need help. Oh my help. gosh. I think what we've discovered Relevant. is I need help. Okay, I'm going to make you a don't monetize it t-shirt. Well, I feel like, I, I, I first I want to just say, I want to say thank you for coming and chatting about this because this was such a fun discussion to just like pick it apart and look at it from from all these like societal ideas. But I want to say, I, I feel like we're going to need some kind of an update, like a voice memo at some point to see how successful you are at keeping the world at bay, because I think that's not going to be easy. But I, I like it, and I think you're up to it. Thanks. I'm very good at the word no. I've practiced it a lot. The year of yes and no for you. That's, yeah, that's yes what's coming. No. I have one question from producer Maria, who's not here. Okay, producer Maria. She wanted to ask if you think you're brave or scared. It's a great question. Both. Absolutely both. How? So first of all, I think that there's a degree of bravery in everyone. I think that we we like to have this like really strict idea of what bravery is. Um, but everyone has something that they're being brave about. It might be not running away when you see a wasp, or it might be standing up to your entire family and saying, this is who I am, take it or leave it. Bravery can be really small or really big. So I will always say that I'm being brave, partially though also because it, if you tell yourself you're brave, it makes it easier to be brave. Yep. Uh, and there's been a lot of times where it would have been easier for me to just stay I left a job that paid me significantly more to come to the job I have right now. That's brave. It would have been a lot easier for me to stay, but I was miserable. I hated it. I cried at least once a week. But it's, I'm also, it is also scared. Like there are times where I've said no to something and realized afterwards that I wasn't saying no because I didn't want to give in to societal pressures. I was saying no because that thing was scary. And I yeah. just, I just didn't feel brave that day. And yeah. I'm trying to always remind myself that it is okay to take turns being scared and being brave. Because yeah. if you're brave all the time, you're going to burn out. Yeah. And it's just not possible. You you can be, there's no way to be one thing all of the time. Exactly. And you you wouldn't be brave if you didn't have the opposite side of the coin scared to, to like to, you need that push pull between the two things to propel you forward. I'm a firm believer in that. Exactly. Sometimes you need to, you know, go cliff diving and sometimes you need to climb into a blank fort. Absolutely. I'm going to end this by giving you both advice. Oh, okay. <laughs> Which is not Damn, my role. Steph. Lay it on us, producer Steph. I don't like this. I think <laughs> Sam going forward should ask herself, uh, wait, do you she, her pronoun? What are your pronouns? Yeah, she, her. At least for now. Who knows? <laughs> should ask herself, am I, like, whenever you're struggling to decide to do something, am I saying no or yes because I'm afraid? Or am I saying no or yes because... I actually don't want to. Like, is it society that's pushing me to make the decision or is it my fear? And I think Robin going forward, yes, Steph. every time something good or bad happens, should ask herself if it's something worth celebrating. I, I love that and I will do that. Okay, I'm going to write mine down, Robin. You write yours down. I like that. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. This was so great. Yeah, this was wonderful. It was really fun. Scary, but fun. <laughs> And by the way, today's tip is more of an affirmation. Forge your own path, friend. You can have the biggest job with the swankiest corner office, but if that gig isn't your heart's desire, it ain't going to make you happy. Now, I'm not suggesting that we all go out and quit our jobs in some kind of a quit-a-thon because we're just not happy. Please do not do that. But I am saying, as you build your work path, listen to your gut. Envision what it is you want 
and don't want and figure that in when you plan your next move. Sometimes it's not all about the job, the title, or the salary. All right, it's that time where I am stopping myself from singing Lizzo. It's about damn time. No, I just, I did it. I'm sorry. Anyway, I'll just say it is about damn time we get to our expert of the day, Tom. He is about to drop some serious wisdom. Take a listen. I've seen this, frankly, where the majority of the interns, the majority of the staff members that were coming in as coordinators or managers would always walk by the office and say, oh, God, I would never want this job. I kind of like where I am. I, I don't want to go too too far up because I lose myself. I lose my personality. I don't want to be on call 24-7. I need work-life balance. When I was at VH1, uh, we did a focus group of millennials. And they said, uh, yeah, if, um, if I threw my BlackBerry, this time when Blackberries were famous, if I threw my BlackBerry into the ocean, I'd be okay. I, would, I really wouldn't miss it. And you saw the entire room on the other side, the audience almost like gasp as if like, you were telling them that you were cutting off their lifeline. So I don't necessarily think that the running up the corporate ladder is as popular as it once was. I think that since everyone is self-published now, everyone can express themselves in so many different ways, you don't necessarily need a gatekeeper to tell you you're successful. You can do it on your own. Here's the deal. For those that jump around every couple of years to job to job to job, you always have that honeymoon period of like a year. So then you have the honeymoon period, and then by the time people figure it out, you're gone. <laughs> so for those that are going to stick around for that, you know, 15 to 20, 25 year, you know, gold watch moment, the only thing I would push back on that is to make sure that you're constantly reinventing yourself inside that building, not necessarily through promotions and things like that, but putting your DNA into that company so that when you leave, you leave some sort of legacy. What is your legacy moment? So as long as you go in and constantly reinvent yourself and evolve within a company when you're going to be there for, you know, 15, 20 years, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that um, that is actually more challenging than jumping around. So if you're offered the opportunity to be promoted and even get more money, but know full well that where you are right now is where you're in your happy place, I think the way you can go about it to show your boss that you're not ungrateful and that you're just kind of quote unquote, phoning it in, because that could be a danger too, right? And say, look, I love what I'm doing now, but I tell you what, instead of promoting me, let's you and I work together on a project. Let's you and I work on something that you would need me for that doesn't warrant a promotion or anything, but is maybe a good sprint to a really good idea that, that you're trying to get off the ground that I can help you with. And that could be my little project to also keep me entertained too. But where I am right now is I really love this job. I, I'm nailing it, but I'm also you know, reinventing myself every year. I'm looking back at my reviews, looking back at myself, my, my reflection every year. But I think if you just at least throw out some sort of overture to your boss, if you don't want to take that promotion, but to show that you're still engaged in, in the organization, I think that would help. But I also do believe the, the reinvention part of it is to keep yourself motivated and to keep yourself entertained because you could atrophy in a place of staying for a very, very long time things like moving your, if you have an office, moving your office furniture around or changing the pictures in your workstation or whatever, just those little things to kind of reinvent yourself, I think is actually kind of important. I've always found a good way of kind of uh, reimagining your job is by doing a mentorship program of other people in the building, because then you actually see where you're working through another set of eyes. And all of a sudden you're like, oh yeah, this is a cool place to work. Yeah, I totally forgot about that. Oh yeah. Because sometimes you do get cynical and jaded. Sometimes you do get a little complacent. And not necessarily complacent that you're just not showing up, but sometimes it's like, you know, okay, now what? You know, or I've done this before. This is the sixth year in a row I'm presenting this deck or I'm presenting this, you know, this idea. We're all human. We do get bored pretty quickly. But I think the reinvention part is really to keep you engaged as much as the people that you work for. Oh, thanks for that, Tom. And I have to say, I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for that guy. He has been mentoring me and friending me for years. So take his advice to heart. Okay, folks, that is it for today. But before we go, I want to say thank you to Sam for sharing her story Sam, you keep on keeping on your own path. You got this. 
for more Robin, and you may need that. You probably don't need it, but like if you do, you can follow me at Real Rob Hops on all the platforms, all the socials, as the kids today say. Well Adjusting is an edit audio original, exec produced by Steph Colburn and Robin Hopkins. Thank you to Maria Passingham, Kathleen Speckert, and the whole edit audio team. Oh, hey, before you take out those AirPods, this show is just for entertainment. If you are in need of help, please, please, please reach out to a professional. Go ahead and get that help. You deserve it. Okay, here's how Miro works. See, it's amazing. What's everyone doing at David's desk? Ever since marketing started using Miro's collaborative online whiteboard, he thinks all our other teams should sign up. Why? He says Miro's making his meetings disappear. And if every team gets on it, that means even less meetings. They're using Miro for brainstorms, mind maps, customer research. So could we use Miro instead of having another 100 meetings for every round of feedback? Yep. You can comment, react to ideas, even leave a recording on the board. And what about presentations? There are Miro templates for that. How do you know so much about Miro? I've actually been using it all along. I just used a Miro board to plan the best vacation. Okay, I'm on board. See how Miro users save up to 80 hours every year by meeting less and doing more. Get on board at Miro.com with three boards free forever. That's M-I-R-O.com.